Perfect. We're a couple of minutes late, so, so, so let's start. So, hello everybody. Thank you very much for being interested in this panel session. The idea for the session is really to speak about a topic which one doesn't speak about a lot, but I believe and we believe it's super important. It's boards. Boards, as most of you know, differ a bit from an Anglo-Saxon setting and a more Germanic setting. Uh, but in the end, for every growth company, we believe boards can add tremendous value. And very often, it's not enough time and efforts paid to set up boards, to help boards, and really use them. So I'm super happy that we got four very, very experienced executives here who share their views, what works well, what doesn't work well, and maybe give a couple of good ideas. Um, I'm briefly introducing them, and then a colleague of mine will come. He's currently on the main stage, and it takes over. So on the right-hand side, it's Mark, Mark Stielke. For those of you who don't know him, Mark is uh, the former CEO of Rebellion Scout, which he successfully built up and helped uh, Deutsche Telekom to sell it to Hellman Friedman. He now decided to take some time to do ventures, to do maybe board seats, to do something else. Before that, he was with Bertelsmann many, many years and successfully with a, a listed company as a CEO. Next to Mark, it's Tim. Uh, for those of you who don't know Tim, Tim is uh, the CEO of Parship, Elite, Elite Media. Um, a very, very difficult task which he took on and it's developing super. Um, it's private equity backed, so he also knows the pressure of a private equity client in a competitive and difficult setting. Uh, next to uh, Tim, it's uh, Oliver. Oliver is with United Internet. He's currently looking after their um, venture activities. He was CEO of the software side of United Internet. Before that, a very successful career within Vodafone on a global basis. And on the left-hand side, it's Jochen. Uh, I think in Berlin, everybody knows Jochen. I think after his very successful years with Holtzbrink, where he built up the complete digital arm, uh, he has invested the last five years, I don't know in how many companies, but in many. So he's a very well-known angel investor, sits on different boards, and is also chairman of many boards. So maybe to, to kickstart the discussion, uh, maybe start with Jochen. So, so what are you looking for? If you are supporting a young company, uh, or you brought in some new investors, what is important within a board, what has worked, what hasn't worked well? I don't like boards. <laughs> <laughs> um, I try to avoid boards as much as I can. I think they are, especially for young companies, a waste of time. Uh, so what we are looking for in, in, when it comes to seed or series A is that we get the right people on board, but not on a board. I don't think that seed companies or A companies need really formalized boards. But what we are looking for is to get people on, um, involved with the company uh, who are really able to help, uh, who can open doors, who can coach management, and um, that is for us much more important than a formalized board. And uh, maybe the most important thing is that we help to establish um, a, a very much KPI-based um, monthly reporting because the correlation of uh, a f formalized report with the success of the company is much higher in our view than um, if the company has a board. Yeah, so, so uh, I, I like boards, but, uh, <laughs> but I agree with Jochen that, uh, that in, uh, in early stage companies, the, the, the modus operandi is, is very much more hands-on and, and informal. So, um, so for the, for the early, earlier stage companies that I work with in a board type structure, it's very hands-on, it's very informal, so it doesn't feel like the typical board meeting in a, in a later stage company. Um, many times, well, well, many times it's also next to sort of building up a, a KPI structure and things like that, uh, about f finding, finding the right way, sort of maneuvering through the maybe different pivots that need to be taken, changes, and, and, and finding stability in, in what they do. So, uh, so I see that the supporters in or outside of boards need to, you know, need to be a bit more flexible, a bit more patient and tolerant, and, uh, and help support you know, the finding of the team in that stage. So, uh, so when, when, 
when I see people that are capable of supporting, it's, it's a lot about, it's less about the policing or governing, it's much more about coaching in that stage, and more tolerance around not necessarily meeting each and every KPI or not having each and every KPI in that stage. And, and we'll, get, we'll get to that third session, which is the, uh, the how you do things, which is super important. Uh, Mark, I mean, um, as, as a company evolves through time, you know, from a, being a startup to becoming more established, how do you see the, the people sitting on that board changing if you had to give sort of advice of people going through that story? Yeah, I think um, w w what stays the same is that you want some proactive support, not just a formal body who, who governs um, and looks at KPIs. Um, but what changes a lot is the degree of operational um, concreteness. So in an early stage, I think people and founders need uh, open doors, um, acquiring talent, uh, finding the right uh, co-founders, second level. Um, opening doors to industry, uh, especially for example in fintech or property tech where I'm investing, you need to have connections to the classical industry in order to win the, the early uh, stage uh, pilot clients, so that's very important also to win some reputation in that industry. Uh, and if you move on and, and if the company scales, then I think other questions like structures, processes, uh, follow-up financing uh, comes into play and that needs other kind of advice and I um, recently happened to be on a board of a company who replaced their supervisory board completely now um, uh, they, after two years uh, because they realized that the degree and the question and the background of people they want support from has completely changed. And Tim, um, in terms of um, uh, chairs, you know, there's, uh, the, the chairman's got very many different roles. From your experience, what makes a great chair and not such a great chair? Well, I think and you can be honest with us on your experience. <laughs> no, I think it very much depends what situation you have. I think generally in working with boards, what is important for me and what I'm finding very often is missing is that you clearly define what the goals are you know, or that you clearly understand what the goals are and they can differ from, let's say, the investor side to the management and the, the entrepreneur side. But I think it's very important that both sides are clear about what the goals are. So if the goals are, let's say, maybe a little bit more conflicting or the investor has a very clear target, is very exit driven, maybe the team is more or less aligned on that but also has to see what is the direction that you want to take, then it's good to have a chair that can actually bridge between the two sides. Yeah, so that can, on the one hand, make things clear to the investor side, how management is feeling cer about certain things, but can also help to convey the message, to convey the goals of the investors to the management. Um, if you have a situation where everyone is completely aligned, and that again depends on the phase that you're finding yourself in, then I would say someone as share who really understands the business, who's close to the business, can be the most helpful. Okay. And, um Here's the thing, but when you're actually in a meeting, right, um, w one of the things that we've realized and I've seen is that a lot of times private equity or VC have a very um, financial, say, driven incentive, which is I, I need to exit in three years, right? Um, and therefore, the meeting gets run in a certain way that's more financial. On the other side, you've got a CEO or you've got a founder that's super passionate about his business or her business, um, really around building a culture, want to invest in people, and sort of they believe in, the, in their vision. How do you balance this in a meeting, this kind of, I, I got to exit versus I got to build this for the long term. So let, let's again start with you, Jochen. That, that's an interesting question. I think it, it only comes up at the later stage. In early stage, I would say the ideas of financial investors, seed investors, area around investors and the founders are very much aligned. Uh, everybody wants to build a, a great company and then uh, get financing um, gone, uh, ready and, and then move on. Um, it really becomes tricky in when you're before, before an exit. And uh, there I've seen uh, very uh, strongly fighting uh, boards uh, where the financial investors really want to op optimize in the short term via IPO and, and the founders, uh, of course, want to manage this for long term. And that's really when it becomes important that you have somebody as a buffer between the two sides. And uh, that is, I think, a role of independent board members at this stage. And you have to bring in strong characters because I can tell you, the guys who finance late stage uh, VC rounds are the tough ones. They are the absolute alpha. 
and in order to control them, uh, you need uh, strong members uh, who are independent and who, who can buffer. And do you agree with that view? Or? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's something I've witnessed as well. Um, also, uh, different timings between different financial investors, some wanting a short-term or, or, let's say, a near-term uh, exit, others we take on board another, another major financial round, financing round, and the conflict there is a difficult one uh, to manage. Uh, also, you know, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, a board member has a, has a fiduciary responsibility against the company. Uh, so, and not necessarily sitting there just to, just to protect his own interests. So, and, but that is very difficult to, uh, to separate for, for most, for most uh, people. So, so I agree, it needs, it needs someone typically independent. So I've seen where we've had a very senior uh, industry, senior industry executive sitting on the board independently. Uh, outside of the, uh, the, the interests of the, uh, the, the financial investors and then bringing in a, a strong view from experience in their, in their corporate c companies. Uh, that, that helps, it doesn't solve, but it at least helps. It takes a lot of okay. moderating, facilitating, but that definitely helps. Like, like but I guess the situation, sorry, Mark, the situation that you were describing is ex kind of a disconnect, no? So investors want one thing, management wants something else, and that's exactly where a strong chair then can come in to help bridge the gap. I mean, to what extent this is really going to work? To what extent you, when you're talking late stage VCs or maybe even worse, private equity, I'm not sure which one is worse in that case. So they're very, very, very committed. They want the exit. This is what they want. Um, then it's maybe also the role of the chair to actually educate management, can they live with it? Yeah? Because it doesn't help you if you then get into a complete battle, this will not lead to anything. And I think this is where the chair can very nicely work as an ambassador between two sides. In addition to conflicts of interest between different investors, I've also witnessed kind of different degrees of information asymmetry. For example, if you have company builders alongside VCs, alongside management, um, where they have different history together, they, some people know each other better than others, um, that adds, um, or adds some uh, element of potential mistrust and that you also need to be aware of and put on the table and, and handle uh, on top of the more financially driven different interests of long term versus uh, short term. And therefore also the CEO needs to be aware of that and manage that actively and obviously a third party um, could be a good moderator on that. Okay. So if I met at something which is uh, no, people don't talk about it, but it's a major issue, especially if the company is not flying as everybody would love to. It's the conflict between different classes of shares. Um, so what I've seen in, in, in cases where the company has done okay, but is not you know, hitting the expectation of the late stage investors is that you have major conflicts between A, B and C round or D round investors. And there you need somebody in order to manage this because these sort of conflicts can really destroy a company. Uh, because of different um, ex expectations. Yeah, and the, the danger with that is you end up losing a lot of time not getting to any decisions. So how, is it again the, the role of the chair or how do you accelerate that decision? I mean, how do you get through that? I think you have to keep the board as small as you as possibly can, but that is a very difficult one because especially in the late uh, stage companies, everybody wants to sit uh, and has a, have a chair on the table. Uh, so keep it as small as possible and yes, get somebody in who can, who has good relationship with all the parties and who can moderate between founders and the different um, investors in the different classes of shares. So just on that point, I mean, uh, with the Vodafone background, um, I think, uh, yeah. Um, you know, someone once said to me, you know, these bigger boards are super boring because they're so big, there's so many people around the table, nothing ever happens. So I get that in a smaller VC environment, having four or five people around the business can really sort of drive the right things. In a big sort of more PLC, how, how does that work? I mean, you've got the experience in it. How do you make sure it's an effective board and not just a waste of time? Well, uh, first of all, to say our board at United Internet, our supervisory board is very small, so it's three people. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so things, uh, things get discussed in a very professional way. 
um, in a very focused way and decisions get taken quickly. So, uh, so we don't have that issue. Okay. <laughs> in, but I agree, in a, in a, in a large uh, uh, PLC, especially where you have uh, uh, workers' councils, representations as well, things can get very complex and slow. But, uh, but I have to say, I've never, I've never had that experience. My, my, the boards I was in, or the boards that have governed myself, have always been very effective and, and focused. And you know, one of the major roles of a board is to make the decision if the CEO is performing or not, or if the founder needs to be changed. Um, I'm gonna look at you, Mark, to throw the fire off the big question is, have you ever had um, a situation where you've had to think through uh, the performance of a CEO, and, and how do you, make those decisions uh, in an amicable way, if it's the right thing for the business? I mean, how do you go through that whole process? I think it's easier with a CEO who is not the founder. Um, it's more difficult with the founder. Um, when you come to a stage where you realize that the business had, has outgrown the founder's capability to further scale the business, and then you need to uh, find a way uh, either to complement uh, him or her, uh, with other team members or to convince him to step back or step out and that is obviously due to the emotional attachment of the, to, to the business um, very challenging uh, but I think a good founder feels that to a certain extent and if you do it in the right way I think you can find good solutions and then start to build a longer term plan how you want to to change the management over time because that's not just a question of three months. Yeah. You can you have a comment on that? Or? In 90% of the cases, early stage cases, where you have to change the management, the company is lost. It's open heart surgery without any tools. Uh, that is a real problem. So um, when, when, when you need to change a team, um, you are in intensive care and you are very probable of losing the company. Definitely one view, yes. But I'm, I'm not entirely sure I completely agree with that because there are also stages, <laughs> stages, <laughs> there are also stages a company is going through. Yeah? And there are also, um, I mean, certain CEOs for certain phases. So someone who's a very good startup entrepreneur, um, maybe is not the one who then wants to go through a phase where there needs to be a bit of restructuring because you're hitting first barriers. Um, or who's not the one to really wants to, who wants to professionalize the organization in terms of structures and processes. So I think there are horses for courses. And that comes then very much down to also the, if it's a founding team, to the founder identifying, is that the right phase for me? Which most probably is not easy. Mm -hmm. Then again, a role of a chair can, can actually help because between the founder and the investors, it might become a bit of a conflict again at that point of time. But if there's someone who can bridge that situation, that can be very helpful. If the company is profitable, then it's no problem. You hire Egon Zenda and you're done. Exactly. But the problem is if the if company... If we can afford our fees, yeah, exactly. but yes. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the other things that, you know, it's, it's the behavior in these meetings, right? Um, you could be, you know, I'll give you the, the fine balance between policing and encouraging. So I get a PNL, I can say, you know, that fourth year number on the margins looks very low, what's going on here? Or I can say, What's going on with the fourth year? I mean, do you guys feel, or do you feel that uh, you know, we're on the right track on our margins? I mean, there's a very different style of behavior in meetings. What are some examples where you've had great behavior that you'd say I'd, I'd replicate that and some other brutal behavior you say that should never happen again? Just to help you know, us as, as we think about you know, people stepping into boards or their own you know, relationships and experiences with boards. We didn't practice for this, by the way. They're on the spot. <laughs> in, in, in general, I'm a big fan of uh, having a non-political, very open-minded, direct con style in the board where, where also the founder and the CEO is open to criticism and, and really doesn't feel injured if you ask critical questions and, and sees that as a kind of good feedback and opportunity to, and, and I, I really prefer teams where you have that style and where you can be very open-minded and address things straight away and avoid any politics that keeps the meetings short and, and uh, let get you to the point. And especially if the performance is not as great as you think, which often is the case, then I think you need to come straight to the point and, and 
point to to issues where you find okay that that's not working in the way uh, and and be constructive and not just point the finger but open uh, and and bring solutions to the table and suggestions that's obviously a prerequisite i fully agree with with mark i think the board should be challenging yeah because otherwise you're spending every month or every three months you're spending four hours together and everyone is waiting for it to be over and that's not a good idea so also as a management you want to take something away from the meeting so if you have a board that is challenging you, that is asking critical questions, that is giving you ideas, that is helpful. I think very often, and I've experienced it a few times, and that goes exactly to your question, it's a little bit the question of how do you ask that question. That's yeah? the question. How do you yeah. ask the question? Yeah. Well, I think you, you, were, you were exactly making the point. If the numbers are not so great, you can say, what, is, what, is, what the hell is bloody going on there? And the numbers are going down and everything looks so poorly. You can say, so how could we improve that? I mean, it's a typical personnel management. Um, or, or typical moderation, motivation that sometimes is maybe lacking a little bit in, in boards. On the other hand, on another example of that is I've, I've seen, seen cases where you have a very good development of a company. I mean, still, there will be the one or the two KPIs that you can still discuss and that you can still criticize. But as a management, you've worked very hard for the other 150 KPIs to go so well. So at times it's also a nice idea to have a little bit of praise for the good development, yeah, because also that gives you a bit of motivation. I know, Jochen, you're itching to say something. Yeah. I can see your yeah. feet, so. Yeah, that's why I said I hate boards. I think we are much too nice to each other, much too nice. Yeah. I mean, uh, we don't want a fight club, but what we got in most cases is really country club management. And, and the reason is that we don't trust each other. No, and the board members don't know each other that well, especially in young companies. Uh, nobody wants to lose uh, face. And what happens is that all the relevant discussions are done on a one-on-one -on -one basis with the management. Yeah. And that's exactly what should not be the case. You should have a board where you trust each other and where from this start you have a very open, very critical, I think, uh, attitude. Because if you're critical from the start, then uh, the management is not surprised that people you know, are challenging when things are more difficult. When you're too nice, when you start too nice and suddenly something turns sour, you know, people are so surprised. surprised that you can be tough. So, no, from the start, be a nasty bastard. Ask, ask the right <laughs> question and, <laughs> and don't to do this only on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but establish really a, a culture of challenge. But I think that comes back to the, to the point that I raised initially to understand for both sides what is actually your goal. Yeah. And that, to me, very often is missing. So you're going into these meetings, but it has not really been established what is the one side interested in, what is the other side interested in. And then it's very hard to have those discussions. And then lead, that leads either to a situation where it's too cozy, as you were describing, because everyone is just tiptoeing tip around, um, or it leads to a situation where everyone feels attacked. Yeah. So when, when, I, when I... Uh, sorry. Just to the point, uh, when I meet founders who are looking for angel investments, I always ask them the question, okay, what, not only what money, but what capabilities do you want in your angel circle? And uh, I try to bring them to the point where they're very precise and uh, I openly say, okay, if I cannot support anything and, and bring anything credible to the table, then it's not the good investment for me, even if it would be may maybe financially. So I think to be very clear from a founder's perspective, what kind of competencies and areas of expertise I need on my board is very important to, to ask that and to, to find good answers and then to ensure that the necessary commitment is there. Because I often found angels who on paper can could add a lot of paper, uh, value, yeah. but then don't have the time or have other priorities or whatever. And then in, after six months of initial energy, there's nothing added. Uh, so make sure that you really understand what's the longer term commitment of your board members. Okay. Because um, one of the things is, of course, alignment of roles and responsibility. So in your own boards today, I mean, do you feel that everybody's clear on what role they play? Because um, if not, it could be sort of, like you mentioned, a, a big mesh. That's one of the big things we find is that you end up hiring someone from Google because that's going to change our board, right? But, uh, but that individual may or may not be able to add value. It's less about the brand name. It's about the experience. I mean, do you find there's enough role definition around that table and alignment? Whoever? Oliver? 
to be honest. I was just, uh, j just, just on, the, on the discussion we had before, maybe okay. just one remark. You, you asked about the, the so, so first of all, to Jochen's point, most of the boards I sit on aren't really the, the country club style, but have that open discussion culture, which is good. Um, a typical situation that arises that it sort of at least once a year is when, when, when there's a kind of a budget discussion and the budget the management presents is sort of different from what the, the multi-year agreed plan was. And especially if you just recently had an invest, investor joining or an investment round based where people had a financial commitment based on certain expectations and all of a sudden management says, well, it's going to be different next year. So then there's a balance between how much do we trust management that this is actually the right plan and the right way to go or how much pressure do we put on them to, to, to stay on track because we just made a financial commitment based on the the recent numbers. So that's, that's something I experience regularly and brings in a lot of tension and maybe differently. First of all, tension between management and, and, and board, then also between the different kinds of investors because they invested at different points of time. Um, and that requires a lot of sort of, uh, yeah, teamwork in the board and between management to figure out and maybe even in the end to take a, a, a tough decision to say, oh, will stick to the old plan or find a compromise or whatever it is then. So um, that's, I think, uh, a situation where good and bad behavior, you comes know, pro proves itself, comes out and, uh, and the, the, you know, the, the, the board can, well, has to prove that it works as a team or as a, as a, as a body. Uh, to your question, Karim, I think it is, uh, we all talked about that it's important to have outsiders, independent board members. The truth is, of course, that it's terribly difficult to find them because you have two types of people. You have the first one are people who left large companies and um, are now keen to join boards for small companies, uh, but they worry most of the time and are still frustrated that they don't have a driver and a secretary when they come to a, a board meeting of a startup and uh, they really feel uh, uncomfortable with the sort of uh, stage and the numbers and the detail of information. So very difficult to integrate some of them. The other type is people who are still you know, working hard um, and know a lot about uh, details and, and what's going on in the market. And there the problem is that they don't have the time and the commitment. So we tried several times to bring them in and um, it failed because their incentive to really add value on a board is uh, of course much smaller than to do their current, current work. So uh, between these two extremes, it's difficult to find the right people uh, to join boards. And an opposing view to, <laughs> is this the view that we all believe that it's basically two groups of people, uh, people who have kind of retired from the operational roles looking to uh, step in and, and the other bucket, because it must be a happy medium in there. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, when, you're, when you're still in an operational business and you're in a business that has similar challenges to the one where you're sitting on the board and you're able to find the time, that can, can be the optimum. Yeah? And I think it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily need so much of your time if you're just spending an hour here, an hour there, a telephone call here and telephone call there to give the input. Yeah? What I'm finding more challenging sometimes in these situations where you're bringing in more operational people to a board, does the management really want that? And then it comes back again to the question of what are really the goals, yeah? Because if you're the manager of the company and then your investor comes along and says, ooh, he's the real topic expert, subject matter expert in this one specific area, do you really want that? Are you open enough to that? And I think that's something that also needs to be established from the beginning because otherwise it just gets frustrating for everyone. Yeah? The management says, ooh, now I have to talk to this guy again. As a board member, you're sitting there, well, I'm giving them lots of ideas. I never see anything realized. And the inventor, investor says, oh, what the hell have I set up here? Yeah, yeah that's exactly, I, I, I've seen that temptation and experienced it myself because I was long years very operational and love to be very operational and you need to, and you're always tempted to say, okay, I, I would do it this way. In the end, the founder or the management is responsible. And that is the fine line of how you um, do your suggestion in a convincing way that they are taken. So you're also happy that some of the advice is taken, but not take uh, ownership and responsibility away from the management. Um. Okay. Um, one, of, one of the things is what happens in the black box. So you have, you know, four meetings or eight meetings a year, and there's all this black box, like nothing happens between different board meetings. You know, what's the most effective way to manage the flow 
uh, the momentum between board meetings. It doesn't appear like you're coming in and have to do all this preparation every four months. It takes up, you know, 50% of the management team's uh, time to get ready. How do you create a consistent, um, supportive flow um, throughout the year, not just, you know, at, at four critical times? So, so my experience is uh, it doesn't work if you just sort of meet and start discussing in the board meetings. The boards that I, I'm in that work most efficiently is where the, uh, the board members, or at least a part of the board members, have a, a, a strong network amongst themselves, pick up the phone, discuss or email. Topics outside of the board meeting are, are at least to some degree aligned or understand where they have different views and then come into the board meeting and have a very effective discussion. So that's, I, in my view, the way to, 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 to a very effective and, and, and uh, professional board meeting. Yo, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid what you're gonna say, but I'm dying to hear. <laughs> I think the, the, the major problem is that shared responsibility is no responsibility. So I think in a board, one or two people have to take the lead. And when I'm a chair and I have a company which is not in autopilot, uh, then I call them up once a week, uh, mainly on Friday. They, you know, guide them or listen to what happened the week, uh, where are the issues, where are the problems, and really be on the ball all the time. And don't uh, expect that other people are doing it if you're not doing it yourself. Yeah, I have to agree with you because I do think that someone needs to take responsibility, especially if, you know, the second month you have an awful quarter, your retention rates are down, you know, people need to address these issues. So it's got to be... Um, you know, someone. Yeah. I think in the, in, especially in the early stage until, let's say, series B or C, the frequency must be much more than quarterly. And uh, I completely agree to you, Jochen, there are usually t one or two people who are in constant contact with the other board members as well with the, with the management team. And then there is a f at least monthly call um, um, between the physical meetings. And then often I find where, where it's a concrete issue, then there's a call or a conference where you address it and don't wait for the next meeting. Yeah, but I'm, I'm even finding that in a late stage environment with a private equity investor, yeah? so at least with the investors having, for example, something like weekly or bi-weekly calls, should, could just be an hour or something like that, would you give a brief update about, the, about what is going on in the business, what the key challenges are, what the key developments are, that really helps to, on the one hand, if I may say so, educate your investor further so they learn more about the business, you have better discussions, and then there are also no surprises at the meetings. Everyone knows what is going on, and then you can actually also get, get the support or get, can get the, the directional input that if you only get it after three months, might come a little late. Okay. We've got literally two more minutes left, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Any kind of last, really two or three different advices you can give on you know, if people had to go back tomorrow and to sit on the board or be part of a board, the two or three things that, you know, to, to really think about and do, be, 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 do better. I think it's, uh, I would give founders who are looking how to, to set up boards basically the two advices which we have mentioned. One is be very clear what capabilities you want and make sure you have the definitive and longer term active commitment of them and watch out for the conflicts which we mentioned because they can uh, destroy the company and you can't avoid them uh, probably but need to be aware and manage them very proactively. I would say for, for both sides, decide what your goals are you know, for the investor slash board and on the other hand the management and then also spend some time to discuss that and if you have maybe somewhat conflicting I mean not in like massive conflict but the one has a tendency there the other one has a tendency there um, then also agree on how you might be able over to overcome that because then the role of a chair of also an independent chair might become more important um, and it, that is very rarely done yeah so just take a step back both sides and and look at what do you want to achieve well, maybe maybe from the uh, from the, the the board's perspective, if you want to join or intend to join or asked to join a board externally, uh, and maybe you are someone like myself from an operational role before, uh, make sure you uh, you uh, you're passionate about you have some degree of passion f for the company because you will need to invest some time, you will need to be close, uh, you will need to, uh, to engage, and it's not just about policing, it's about uh, you know, being, being part of the team as well. So uh, 
uh, that would be my advice. And also, I agree with Mark. Um, you know, you have to you have to live with the fact that your advice is sometimes interpreted in a different way, and people do things differently. And that's difficult for someone who comes from sort of a more operational responsibility. And your final word of the. Uh... <laughs> Everybody looks at valuations right now, and I think the founders, even the very early stage ones, want to maximize, and in each and every later round, everybody are only looking at valuations. And my advice would be, valuation is, of course, important, and um, you should try to get a good one, but don't maximize and sacrifice the reputation and the track record of the investors you're taking on board, uh, because that is, at the end, uh, the, the most deciding one is the exit valuation and not the dilution during your financing rounds. And if you have a great management team and you get on top of that a great board with people who have a track record in building good companies, then it's much more important than short-term valuations. And so, uh, given how many unicorns are crashing, it's probably very good advice. So um, I'd like to thank on behalf of Noah and Egon Zender, Joachim, Oliver, Tim, and Mark, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. And thank you for all the insights.